funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. In our modern world, communicating with someone whether by landline, phone, mobile, texting, email, tweet, Facebook or whatever is a fundamental part of daily life for countless Irish people and is perhaps taken for granted by most of them. However, in the old days when most people didn't have telephones, the post was really the only way for them to communicate, other than talking face to face. Social historian James Scannell of the Bray Coolin Historical Society. Originally, there were used to be four deliveries a day. So you could send a letter out to somebody say, will you come to tea? They would have got a postcard and they could reply back to you and say, yes, I'll come. And you could write back and say, what would you like? And they could write back and say, I'd like cucumber sandwiches. The postal service was so efficient that you could actually... Have was that all over the country or just all, in the city? All, mainly, it worked mainly in the urban areas are far better because in the, in the country areas it was more difficult because the postman had a greater area to cover. But in the, the urban and cities it worked very well and uh, it was the precursor of our texting and mobile phones we have nowadays, you could say. And uh, then sort of after World, World War One, then it was curtailed to two deliveries a day. And certainly my memories in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we used to get two deliveries a day. Well, it was the only form of real communication. Um, a lot of people didn't have phones down around the country, and those that did, you had to go and ask a neighbour, could you use the phone, or maybe go to a local shop, and you were standing there waiting on your call to come. So to, to communicate with people, you know, you had to write them a letter, you know, or, or send them an advertiser, send them something that you want them to do, or, you know, so if, if you wanted to contact somebody about something, you had to write them. Post office customer, Ger Toner. Here's the story in John Lennon from Dundrum, County Dublin, who is a leading authority on the history of the post office in Ireland. It was the only communication people had in both days. I mean, I've got some postcards now in my collection where local Dublin was admittedly, where somebody wrote a postcard in the morning at 10 o'clock, I won't be home for lunch, and sent it in the post. And somebody asked, I can't meet you this morning, can we meet this afternoon? I mean... I posted at 9 o'clock, it would have been delivered before 12 o'clock. I pretended those days. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. The, the post was the only communication. There was a basic phone the system going back in the 20s and 30s, but most people didn't have the phone. Only very, very few has had the phone. So the letter was the means of communication. Short of actually going there yourself to talk to somebody, letter was the only way of doing it. The emphasis was on mail in this pre mobile phone era. Veering away from the old ways to our modern postal services, I recently asked various post office users in Dublin City and beyond what their local post office meant to them. I find the postal service extremely important in Irish society. It's very, very reliable, it's always on time. Post office, I do everything in it. It's the place where I go to buy stamps, do some banking transactions at it. Posting things away to family in Canada and Australia. Uh, My name is Robin Murphy. I'm 20. (laughs) Great, great. Now, Robin, what does the post office mean to yourself? Well, I think it's kind of like a way of connecting, I suppose. I spent a summer in Canada there just not too long ago, and, you know, my mum was able to send me over lots of things that I could kind of keep me going, make me feel not so homesick. Well, I think the post office, every post office is brilliant because you can go in and ask them questions that you might know how to open a post office book. And also you can pay your bills and then you can transfer your money in it, which, to me, they're very good. And it's great to have in the communities. Our local post office is part of who we are. And um, it's, it's absolutely fabulous to go in. You don't get a teller or a machine, you get a human. And that's what it's all about. That's what the post office is all about. About the customers, it sends their focus about being part of a community, being able to offer, you know, huge amount of services. While the post office's traditional bread and butter work was delivering mail, nowadays it offers a vast array of services, from services for e-commerce and online companies, to parcel and mail deliveries, to community financial services, to being a one-stop shop for government financial services, and much more. Stephen Ferguson, Post Office Historian and also Assistant Secretary of Unpost. 
It does traditional savings services, which are still there from children to older people. We have post office savings bank accounts. We have prize bonds. We have state savings services. All of these things are done through retail. But there's also more modern services where we offer accounts for people and we provide lots of payment channels for people. If you are coming from abroad and you want to change money, we have Bureau de Change facilities, for instance, for major currencies. Our whole future is based around financial services, government services, and being the backbone of e-commerce for communities, because that's a massive growth area. Anna McHugh, Head of Communications with Unpost. And already we've seen that in how we've transformed our parcel business, you know, to take advantage of the massive boom in online shopping. And that's been led by the market. That's been led by customers who are choosing. But they want to be able to shop. They want to be able to collect their items, have them delivered where and when it suits them. And another growth area for our modern post office is banking. Anna McHugh. In recent years, we have been very successful in taking over everyday banking services for a number of the banks who have been, you know, closing their local branches in in local areas. And that has been so successful for us and so good for customers. And, you know, we have the technology and we have the people and that human touch that's really important, that greeting and that human attention to your business. We have still a very big network throughout the country. We have an efficient and friendly body of staff. The post office is personal. You can come down and you know who you're dealing with. Friendly staff in my local one. (laughs) The local one would be in Phippsburg. You're meeting someone, you're talking to someone directly, you're arranging for something to be taken from you, to be passed on, and it's the human contact. That's really where it is. And so it's, it's it's the community aspect and the human contact. That's the most important. What do you use the post office now you when you would use it? Lodging money of a post office account and sending parcels. The post office is so handy. All the new services they're bringing in, some of them are absolutely brilliant. The post office is a brilliant service, absolutely. We'll hear more about our modern post office and its vast array of services to the general public later in this programme. But first we need to briefly investigate the roots of the postal service in Ireland. Just when did it begin and how did it develop? Historian John Lennon. The roots came about originally for London Marching to Control Ireland and Queen Elizabeth was the first person, Queen Elizabeth I appointed an alderman in Dublin, one of the Dublin Council alderman, Nicholas Fitzsimons, as the official postmaster of Dublin in 1562 to arrange for the letters between communication between London and Dublin. And that was his job. And that was, Queen Elizabeth was the first person. And when King Charles then tried to set up an official royal mail, he ran into trouble because of the rebellion in Ireland in 1641, the civil war in England, and nothing came of it until Cromwell wanted an official postal service in Ireland so he could control the country. And it was thanks to Cromwell that we got an Irish postal system with postal routes from Dublin to Cork to Galway to Coleraine, which was the destination in the north, with a branch to carry Fergus, because Belfast wasn't significant in those days. And it had branch posts to the various main towns. 26 of the main towns in Ireland got a post from I think April 1656. So that was when Ireland got its first postal system, thanks to Oliver Cromwell. The early days of postal delivery in the country was done through what were called post boys. And they weren't boys, of course, they were they were men, but it was the terminology used. And these are men who would have ridden on a horse and walked. And there would have been three main routes throughout the country. There was a western route, there was a southern route down towards Cork, and a northern one that went up towards Belfast and Derry. Historian Stephen Ferguson. But towards the end of the 18th century, we had a sort of revolution in how things were done, and the mail coach was introduced. There had, of course, been coaches for ordinary transport, but following on from the idea of a man called John Palmer, who introduced a coach between London and Brighton across the water, various enterprising people here and businessmen around the country called for the post office to introduce a mail coach system. So from 1789, 1790... 
there was a proto mail coach system introduced in the country, and it followed the routes to Cork and to Belfast and to Galway and developed from there along further spokes and routes throughout the country. It became an, an efficient system, but of course it depended quite a lot on the condition of roads. Mail coaches that led to the need to have better roads, and at that time it was a time when there was a major improvement in the design of vehicles. So things that we take for granted, like using springs on vehicles, not only made them more comfortable, but it meant they were better able to cope with poor quality roads instead of shaking to bits. Historian Rob Goodbody of the Quaker Historical Committee of Ireland. And also there was a huge improvement in the engineering of roads, how the construction, so that they were better able to withstand bad weather, rain, heavy vehicles going over them. So the roads were much improved. So with those two things going together, improvement in roads, improvement in vehicles, meant that now you could realistically bring in what were then relatively heavy vehicles, the mail coaches, for transportation of the mails over long distances relatively rapidly. So that in itself fed into the improvement of roads. And so we saw huge increase across the country in the quality of the existing roads and building of new roads. My grandfather, as it happens, drove the Royal Mail from Dundalk to Castle Blaney for a period in his life. And uh, there are stories within the family of the traditions of the coach. And, of course, they weren't just carrying mail, they were carrying passengers and uh, carrying goods that they maybe shouldn't have been carrying as well. They were carrying messages from one family to another. And I suppose the greatness of that link was that it was constant and it was regular and uh, people could depend on it. Previously, I think communications would have been much more sporadic. So this was a method of communication which could be trusted. County Loud based social historian Michael Murta. So what were the challenges in working on a mail coach? Stephen Ferguson. Well, if you were travelling as a mail coach driver or mail coach guard, the first thing to remember is you were travelling through total darkness at night because a lot of the routes were done at night. There were some day ones too, but if they were longer journeys, you certainly had to have a period of travel at night. Roads were not lit, and while there was development in the building of roads in the late 18th and early 19th century, and we had some quite good roads here, there were the ordinary dangers of going off the road, hitting objects and things like that. In addition to that, you had to worry about highwaymen who would be waiting behind rocks or trees in order to attack the coach and hold it up. And there was, in comparison with England, for instance, Ireland was always a more disturbed country. And in the late 18th century, after the aftermath of the 1798 Rebellion, for instance, after Emmett's Rebellion, there were displaced and disaffected people throughout the country. And they saw the um, the mail coach as a representation of government and authority, and they also knew that there would be some wealthy people travelling on these things, and that the post might contain articles of value. So it was a natural target for ordinary robbers and those who wanted to make a particular point about things. So there's a large number of attacks in the early 19th century on mail coaches. How did the staff on the mail coach protect themselves? The staff were issued with weapons, or at least the guards were. The driver was responsible for the horses, and he was full-time keeping his eyes on the road and driving the horses. But at the back of the coach, there would be one or two male guards, and they were issued with guns, what was a blunderbuss gun, a sort of short rifle thing with a, a, a big spout at the beginning, and also sometimes with swords and with pistols. So sometimes out of Dublin, if there were particular worries about areas, the male coaches might be escorted by a small troop of soldiers for some distance but once they'd gone beyond the city limits they were really on their own and the male guards might have to discharge their weapons if there was an attack there sometimes they suffered injuries themselves and there were some fatalities of course over the years too so it, it, it wasn't a an undertaking that you would take on lightly I think because there certainly were dangers The uh, area here in which I'm speaking in County Louth and uh, nearby County Meath was the raiding ground for Collier the Robber, who was one of the more famous highway robbers. And uh, it, it was 
without question, a danger. And in the newspaper reports of the early 19th century, you will hear about banditti and groups of robbers and pillagers and so on. So it was undoubtedly dangerous. Michael, Murta. Indeed dangerous not just for male coach staff and passengers, but also for robbers if they were caught. Historian John Lennon. To steal the mail was a capital offence and mail coach robberies, you were taking your life in your hands by doing that, or stealing a mail. And an awful lot of them used to try and get onto the boat as quick as they could after a mail robbery and get over to England or somewhere, get away from it. But if they were caught, a lot of them were and were hanged. And it was public hangings in those days, before 1830s, 1840s, hangings was a local spectacle. The danger was there of robbery, but the danger was also there because of the conditions of the roads, because of the weather conditions, and of course because of the unpredictability of the horses and the frailty of the carriages as well. So you do hear stories about crashes, so to speak, of those horse-drawn coaches, and of course accidents in snowstorms and in adverse weather conditions. We're talking about a time when winters were vastly more severe than they are today. And so snow is going to be quite an impediment to travel. And all the Christmas card idea, think of Christmas cards uh, where there's still a lot of them around, picturesque mail coaches heading through the snows. It's all very picturesque, but snow drifts are going to stop a mail coach. And that's the least of your problems. Ice is the worst one because the good mail coach roads will try to avoid hills. But if you've got a hill, you've got ice. Same today as you did uh, now. If you go out on the roads when it's been snowing and all the traffic's been on the roads on a hill, it's going to be slippy. Today we have highly efficient gritters doing the roads. We have snow plows. Back then there was none of that. So if you had a problem, you had to try and dig yourself through a snowdrift and get out and you're trying to make sure that your horses with their iron shod hoofs are not slipping on slippery ice on the roads as well. So there's quite a lot of hazards in it. It's not a 100% reliable service. But given that those are the hazards you face, notwithstanding that, it's a very efficient and reliable service. Rob Goodbody. So when was the heyday of the mail coach in Ireland? Historian Stephen Ferguson. The mail coach really had a pretty brief window of operating because it came in, as I was saying, that at the very end, the sort of tail end of the 18th century, and it worked regularly up until the 1830s or early 1840s. But at that stage, we then had the introduction of railways. And very quickly, the development of railways, railway mania at the time, with a lot of money and business people putting their ideas into action, This put paid to the main mail coaches because obviously the railways were faster. The 19th century post office was revolutionised by four major historical developments which happened between the early 1830s and 1850s. First, increased literacy in society. Second, the coming of the railways. Third, the introduction of the penny post. And fourth, the introduction of letter boxes. Dealing with each of these developments in turn, we begin with Rob Goodbody discussing literacy. The literacy levels in Ireland start to grow to a huge extent from 1831. From 1831, the national school system was set up so that there was a system of government funding for schools. And as a result of that, there was a a substantial increase in the number of schools all around the country, and that helped to feed into literacy. With increased literacy leading to more letter writing and thus more business for the post office. The second major development for the post office during this era was the coming of the railways. Stephen Ferguson. Railways again, the first one, Dublin to Kingstown Railway, or Dunleary as we call it now, um, that was the first railway in Ireland to carry mail by contract for the post office. It was only a short distance, but 
the journey out from Westland Row out to Kingstown as it was, the post office was it was at the forefront of trying to introduce new technological developments at that time, as it has been since. So the introduction of railways meant the introduction of speed. It, it enabled the post office to deliver letters on a much faster time scale than was done previously. The railways, they were really moving the mail around. It revolutionised the time it took compared to going by mail coach and things like that. James Scannell. Here's Rob Goodbody. The way that the railways facilitated the postal service was enormous. Let's take Dublin to Cork. Your train sets out there and it does that. Of course, it stops at stations along the way, but you don't have the delay for stopping to change horses every 40 kilometres or so. And... Um, It's quick, it's reliable, and it can carry an awful lot more letters than a single mail coach could as well. And then with private carriers running connections from the railways to other places that weren't served by the railways, that all helps. And the third major development for the post office in this era was the Penny Post. Stephen Ferguson. The vital thing that happened was 1840, and this is when an English entrepreneur and businessman and teacher, Roland Hill, uh, later Sir Roland Hill for his work on the postal side of things, he looked at the postal service and he saw that it was something that was very expensive because the charges at the time were based on distance and it was the recipient of the letter who had to pay. So very often people were being obliged to pay substantial portions of their weekly wages on receiving letters. So he had the idea of introducing penny postage, although there had been a sort of penny postage system before, but he introduced universal penny postage so that it was possible to send a letter from Dublin to Belfast or Dublin to Cork for one penny. And the theory which he had from an economic point of view was if he reduced the price of letters, he would increase volumes. And this happened. It took a while, and he had his critics in the post office at the time, certainly. But over the longer term, it certainly led to a great increase in business. And that, combined with the literacy and the railway systems, led to much higher volumes for the post office. The Penny Post... And what it did was, it joined people together for the first time. It made the world small, that we could communicate with people which were so far away. Historian John Sheffield of the Revenue Museum in Dublin, Castle. Here's James Scannell once more. Penny Post was revolutionary in the sense that for the first time, you could prepay your post. And the system was that, with the stamp, it told everybody this had been paid. Universal Penny Postage. It was really democratising the post office in many ways. The fourth event that's important in the development of the 19th century post office was the introduction of something that we see every day, which is the letterbox or the postbox in the street. And the credit for this goes largely to the novelist Anthony Trollope, author of you know lots of well-known novels, uh, Palace or novels and other ones people will remember. And he worked for the post office and he actually worked for quite a long time in Ireland. He was an Englishman by birth, but his career in London was not going anywhere. And rather than getting sacked, he accepted a job in Ireland where things went much better for him. But he's remembered particularly for the introduction of this sort of iron box into which people would post their letters. So instead of having to bring your letter to a receiving house, as it was called in those days, you could place it in a little post box by the street. And certainly in metropolitan areas, largely built up areas, it was very much easier for people of all classes and conditions of life just to put their letter in, put on one of the new postage stamps, which again was part of Roland Hill's idea. So you had a penny stamp, uh, you wrote your letter, and you stuck it in an envelope and posted it in the box. And it was collected then by postmen later in the day. So it was making things easy for people. Uh, It was cheap, it was efficient, and it was a service that appealed to all classes of people so that they could communicate with each other. And 
as was touched on earlier. The coming of the railways from the 1830s onwards revolutionised the speed at which mail could be delivered. The system was further improved in the 1850s by the introduction of so-called TPOs, which is post office jargon for travelling post offices on trains. Stephen Ferguson. The new railways. As lines extended and as they were built, a further introduction was introduced in 1855 when particular sorting carriages were added to railways so that you would have a small carriage with pigeonholes in it and you'd have a couple of post office staff so that the letter from Dublin to Cork, for instance, it was possible to sort that as the train was going and the introduction of what was called the apparatus meant that letters could be picked up in a bag that was hanging by the side of the railway and another bag could be thrown off by the sorters into a net that collected it all while the train was going past at maybe 40 or 50 miles an hour. The TPO or Travelling Post Office Network became a vital linchpin in post office operations throughout Ireland and beyond allowing much greater speed in processing and delivering mail. The TPO or Travelling Post Office it gave a reach and a scope to postal operations which meant that letters could be picked up and delivered very fast and it would be possible for people and business people to send and get replies uh, certainly overnight, sometimes within the same day. So that's the sort of system that was operated by the post office at the time and the TPO network made that possible. The TPO network existed in Ireland from the 1850s right up to the 1990s. Former TPO worker Hugh Kelly. I worked with men on the TPO that worked on what they called the Wexford. But uh, Dublin Cork and Dublin Galway were the ones we ended up with. And uh, they went down day in the morning and up day in the middle of the day. It was to facilitate second deliveries a lot, and we're in towns as well, you see, right around the country. There'd be second deliveries in all the major towns. And in order to facilitate that second delivery, you had to have the down day in the morning brought the mail from the mail boat to sort it on the way. And it went out to... And the down It was delivered in a bag uh, that was kind no. of had a mechanism for yeah, delivering the bag in the town, uh, sorted on the go, yeah. so time was of the essence yes. and time was utilised to the full. Even on the Dublin and Galway and Dublin and Cork TPO, you could send a dispatch directly to a TPO in England. So there were certain letters circulated to certain TPOs, and crew usually took a lot of the letters anyway, crew forward from there for and London, IS and Red Hill took the ones for down around London, like, you know, the home counties. But uh, the post office system, as it was set up, is an excellent system. But I'll just give you an insight into the TPO. You had to undergo a medical before you would be allowed out on the TPO. If you had varicose veins, you had no hope of getting out. Usually down in the pulmonary unit in Bagger Street Hospital, we have to go to a Dr. Chapman there, and he would certify you fit or not for the TPO. I was lucky enough, I got out on it in the early 70s. I was a post office clerk at the time and uh, I worked in the early 70s from Dublin to Cork and Dublin to Galway. Mostly I would go down as far as Limerick Junction on the down night and change over and come up night on the train coming from Cork. So the mail was going up and down, just coming up from Cork, down from Dublin. And there was a great system in place. So good a system that the post office utilised TPOs not just on railways, but also on the mail boats which plied the Irish Sea, in particular the vital route linking Dublin and London. Brian Ellis, maritime historian and also honorary librarian of the National Maritime Museum of Ireland, located in Dunleary, County Dublin. The main link between Dublin and London, two major cities of the Empire, was via the railway and the mail boat. Was, it was called the mail boat in those days because its primary function was to carry the mail. Oh, they carried hundreds of passengers as well, but it was critical that it carried the mail. And there was a long battle between different companies to get that contract. It was a very lucrative contract. They had the fastest ships in the world of the day at that time, in the beginning of the 20th century. And they had to have the mail sorted in London by a particular time. It was taken from the post office in Dublin, brought up by rail from different places around the country, brought up by train to Kingstown and put onto the boat. They had special 
areas in the boat for sorting the mail. Um, What's called a travelling post office, a yeah, TPO, yeah. but in a mail boat setting. Yeah, yeah, the same as they had the similar things on the train on the other side, so that the sorting could continue as they went. The mail was loaded onto the mail boat, and the 20 or so mail boat workers, they would be working from the GPO. They'd have a rota, they'd go on, they'd travel on the mail boat, and they would source the mail. And perhaps the best-known mail boat which plied the Dublin-Hollyhead route in times past was the RMS Leinster, which was tragically torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat in October 1918, with close to 570 people losing their lives. Historian Roger Kirk of the National Maritime Museum in Dunleary. Just sailed out of Dunleary on the morning of the 10th of October, and uh, she was four miles east of the Kish lightship and she got torpedoed and the captain uh, took the ship round to try to head back to port and she got torpedoed again. The torpedo passed straight into the post office sorting area. There were over 20 post office sorters there who were sorting out letters for further dispatch all around UK and uh, only one survived. Essential to any efficient postal system is a general post office or GPO, which can direct operations. The GPO in Dublin is perhaps one of the most iconic buildings in Irish history, due to its pivotal role in the 1916 Rising, which gave birth to our modern Irish state. Stephen Ferguson, post office historian and also author of the book GPO Staff in 1916. The 1916 Rebellion, 1916 Rising, when what was a small group of people who were very keen to assert Irish independence took over the post office here and made it their headquarters. And the reason they took it over, I believe, was because it had the telegraph office in it and telegraph lines were cut on Easter Monday, 1916, and there were staff here working in the building and the first they knew of something odd happening was when their lines suddenly went dead on them. And that marked the very beginning of the 1916 Rising. So for Easter week, for the six days of the Rising, the rebels held the GPO and other buildings throughout the city and tried to establish an Irish Republic. But the building, of course, then came under some artillery fire and it was burnt to the ground. The roof collapsed. The walls remained, but structurally it was in a very bad way. And then the end ended and the rebels gave up. And although the rebels lost the battle, their side eventually won the war and clinched an Irish free state. Since then, the GPO has meant much to many Irish people. For many people, the GPO has a significance that strikes emotionally at their hearts, if you like, that sort of touches their heartstrings. And when people think about Ireland and when people think about Dublin, the building that they think of is the GPO. The General Post Office itself is a part of the Irish history, for a start. I mean, a very important part, if not the most important part of Dublin's history. It would be the place where the rising took place, the start of it, and the reading of the proclamation. And that's what it would represent to me. The country as a republic started here. So, uh, yeah, it is something that I'm very proud of and to see it and that it has history. And it's great to see a museum in it. It's very, very good. The General Post Office in O'Connell Street, one of the most famous and iconic buildings in the whole of Ireland. There's history in the GPO more than any other post office. The post office is actually there for the people of Ireland. When the Irish Free State was established in 1922, believe it or not, the new state's largest employer was the post office. So how did it adapt to the regime change, with Dublin now in charge and no longer London? Historian James Scannell of the Bray Coolin Historical Society. The post office staff, as far as they were concerned, it was just the administration change at the top. 
postmen were still postmen. It just meant they were different paymaster in the sense that it was now going to be Sarah Stout and Heron pay them rather than Her Majesty's government. So they just carried on before. Obviously, they had to adapt to certain changes and regulations that had been brought in by the new Sarah Stout Heron government because that's what the government was called. The, the British couldn't had no word for republic, so free state was the compromise. So they came up with Sarah Stout. So of course they had thousands of stamps left so one of the things that the stamps they just overprinted them so instead of having our own stamps they took the existing supply of stamps which they had with the britannic majesty on it and they overstamped them sir stock the hern or real sir shall look the hern 1922 and they just overprinted them and issued them out as irish stamps until they had time to originate their own stamps so they just carried on with that the other course thing is they didn't like the idea of imperial crimson because that was the colour the British administration used all over the world. So the red now. The red, the red, red, yeah. It's, I think it's called Imperial Christmas. We call it red, but technically there's a technical colour for it. But so they just decided to give everything a good colour of green because that was the national colour. So they just got on with it and painted the post boxes green. So that meant they didn't have to buy new post boxes. They didn't have to replace post boxes. So it was a case of just adapting what we have for new posts. So they just carried on. The postman obviously got new uniforms. They had, they got the harp instead of the crown and things. So what services were undertaken by the new Irish Free State's post office? Historian John Lennon. Well, they purely took over the services that were there already. At that time, you already had the parcel system, you had the telegraph system, the telephone system, the savings banks, all the services. Including the new public service of radio. Stephen Ferguson. The new things that came in in the 1920s, the big one was radio. And radio, of course, was something that was entirely new at the time. The BBC had been set up across the water, and there was a desire to set up a similar sort of station here, broadcasting. So prototype broadcasting was done, and then it was decided that it would be run by the state rather than by private sector interests. So the post office was given the job of running radio. So there was a a radio broadcasting studios incorporated in the the GPO in O'Connell Street. They had a certain amount of independence and they were different sort of people, but they were part of the overall post office remit as well. So that if people are walking under the GPO portico today, as they walk under that bit and maybe shelter from the rain, if they stop for a minute, they won't realise that just above them was a relay station for broadcasting where there was a microphone which was put down through a little hole and on certain state occasions that microphone would pick up speeches from the dignitaries who were making speeches underneath and then it would be relayed from the broadcasting studios upstairs. So a lot of our sort of well-known personalities over the last generation, a lot of them started their broadcasting careers in the GBO. Many social commentators agree that the heyday of the traditional post office was the first half of the 20th century, when people still relied heavily on mail, and the Irish post office had a monopoly over other means of communication, such as telegrams, telephones, and as we've just heard, radio. By the 1980s, this monopoly had ended. Also in recent decades, traditional mail delivery by boat and train has been replaced by trucks, vans and airplanes. Despite these changes in the advent of the internet and modern digital communications, thankfully our contemporary post office is successfully adapting to an ever-changing Ireland by offering a vast array of new products and services. We'll hear about these shortly, but first it's opportune to let the spotlight fall on some of the foot soldiers of our modern post office. Yeah, how are you? I'm Kieran Young. I'm a postman in Dublin too. Now, Kieran, what are the challenges of the work of being a postman in Dublin too? Well, the, you can see today it's the weather is the big challenge, and also the volume of parcels and the weight, the weight of the parcels. The new, we've got a few new contracts, so parcels are very important to the business, but they obviously weigh a lot more than the letters. I mean, I've seen a few of your colleagues just today in action. And they're big parcels, yeah, you know, yeah, deliveries yeah, yeah. to jewellery shops, you know, every retail outlet in the city. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, there's, like a lot of people do online shopping, as well as businesses getting stuff sent through the post, so it's kind of gone through the roof, so that's the big challenge, Alry, the big challenge now. 
And Kieran, for yourself, I mean, how long have you been a postman here? In me 35th year. Wow, yeah, 35 yeah, years yeah. and still going strong. Still and what, going what strong. You, obviously, you love the work here. I do love it, yeah, I do. I enjoy it, but it's, you know, I'm 52 now, so I'm not, it's not getting any easier. You know what I mean? but you're, still, it's just, you're still uh, enjoying it anyway, you yeah. know. I mean, we were just shooting I the still, breeze I still on. am enjoying it, but I can see the finish line, so. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? At this day, at today now it feels like I wish the finish line had come quicker. But I mean, because our listeners yeah. thought, give a more picture to the listeners of what kind. We're in the middle of November. Yeah. It's, uh, what kind of a day is it? A uh, soft day. Soft, <laughs> soft west of Ireland day with the rain bucketing down yeah, and everything. Yeah. I mean, there's. Yeah, yeah, uh, one of those days for a good umbrella. Yeah, you, well, a postman can't be said to have an umbrella. You know, we have all the rain gear, so that kind of helps. But uh, you just on a day like today, you wouldn't be as talkative to people. You'd be just keep on go, keep the head down, nod, how you say hello, and that'd be it. You'd just keep going. People now, you know what I mean. They don't want to get the hold you on a day like today. You know what I mean. And Kieran, also as well. I mean, it's very obvious you love the work. What is it that makes you love the thing that you've stuck at for well over thirty years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only went in for a stamp, but I don't ever. Uh, um, they kept me, uh, but uh, now I think it's the, the lad. You, like, if you get to work with a group of lads and girls now at this stage, you, when I started, there wasn't as many girls, but now there's more. So I reckon you enjoyed a bit of crack with the lads. Like if you're working in an environment where there's people and you're allowed to have a chat and that in the morning that's good and then when you're out on the road you get to meet different people stuff like that you know what I mean so we enjoy that side of it you know the, the side of it where you're dealing with people and then you can have a bit of fun in the mornings with the lads sometimes on Friday now I'd meet a few lads so I work with after work we'd have a coffee and a bit of crack you know around town so that's mm-hmm. it. So in other words, the human side of yeah, things yeah, you know yeah, what I mean and it's just the banter and yeah. as, as well as getting the work done. yeah yeah, I enjoy. Um, I enjoy all that. I enjoy the. Um, like, it's nice to. See, you get a bit of satisfaction now seeing an empty bag at the end of the day as well. You know, sometimes you have to bring stuff back if it does not. Someone's not in, but when you have an empty bag, you do get a certain amount of satisfaction. You know. My name is Suzanne Whelan. Oh, Suzanne, yeah. how long have you been a postwoman? Postwoman, 23 years. 23 years, and yeah. why did you become one? I was working somewhere else at the time, and I was let go, and I asked, my father was a postman, so I just asked him, was there anything going for the moment to kind of tide me over? So there just happened to be two vacancies, and off I went up to Edmundstown, and I didn't really think I was going to stay there for long, but once I got going, I just couldn't see myself doing anything else now. Wow, and you yes. love the work, Suzanne. You were telling me earlier on you just you yeah, really like the work. I, you love it. Yeah, I do love the job. Now I don't like getting up early. That's the killer for me. I don't mind the dogs, the rain, the bad weather. It's getting up early. The rest is a doddle. <laughs> Compared to once I'm out of bed, I'm laughing. And Suzanne, you were saying you love the work. I mean, what what is it about the work you love so much? I just love being outdoors and you get to know the people. I've been around here now 10 years. I've this been down the same Dundrum area. Yeah, Dundrum, uh, Meadow Grove, Aylesby, Limwood, all up around the back of the town centre. And you just get to know the people. And like every walk of life, you click with some people and, you know, meet the same faces and have a chat here and there. and you know, you're getting to know the right land, you're getting to know the community inside yeah, out, and I, it's I'm community. From, I'm from Dundrum, so it's nice, you know, it's familiar. Yeah, it's familiar, and the people are lovely. And veering away from Dundrum in suburban Dublin, I next got chatting with a certain postman in rural County Wexford. Brendan Wickham is my name. I started working as a postman in, in 1983, so I'm 36 years at the job now. Um, a lot of water under the bridge, Brendan. A lot of rainfall <laughs> in that time. Yeah. Brendan, from the time you get up in the morning to the time you mm. get home from work, what's the normal daily routine? You know, How does it go from, <clears throat> from start to finish? Well, usually I leave home here about half six maybe I start work at 6.45 in Wexford sorting office sorting all the letters first into the various slots in the working bench and what have you and 
large envelopes and packets and then then I head out on my deliveries so I start off in Tagot village I head then towards my own homeland Broadway I head for Tecumseh then and then down to Cairn Ladies Island and Cairn it's a famous pilgrimage area down there so yeah there's a good bit of old driving I suppose I cover what would it be a hundred kilometers in all so yeah, it's a lot of old driving, but the houses are spaced out, so you never get bored of it, sort of a thing, you know. But yeah, you you get to know all the places, and there's a lot of old people actually lived all their lives here, and they're still around, and thank God, and, and you know, you just get to know them, and uh, and it's, it's, it's lovely, actually. There's a nice, plus the scenery around here is fantastic, and uh, it's, it's just lovely to be there. I mean, it's more of a... An enjoyment than working, you know, you'd, 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 you'd love it. But, uh, a labour of love, isn't it great, isn't it? Love. The very thing, yeah. Staying with Matters Rural, after my chat with Brendan Wickham in Broadway, which is situated in the southeast corner of County Wexford, I next travelled over 40 kilometres by car to Campile Village in the south-west corner of rural County Wexford to find out how locals there felt about their local post office. You're talking to Shannon Power. I live up in Campile. Um, we use the post office daily every day. I work across the road in Hearts. It's a great little place for the community and there's always some conversation going on or there's always things that you kind of don't know what's going on around the village and you have a look on the notice board and it's all up on there so it's used every day and it's a vital part of our community and Shan it's not only no you're not on your own today Shan you have no, companions with you who I have do. you got with you now I have my son Eddie and I have my niece Kira. Eddie is eight and Kira is two do you want to say hello to the listeners Eddie hello I'm just talking with a good person here now. Who am I talking with, first Bridget. of all? Bridget. From uh, Bella Killan. Campile. Campile, right. Yeah. And, and Bridget, what does your local post office mean to yourself? Oh, an awful lot. I go there regularly and during the week. And on a Friday, I do my bills there and go to the local shops then and keep everything happy around the community. So it's kind of it's all yeah. part of the, the fabric oh, of the yes. community? Yes, it is. Keep the shops open and... Keep everything in business. And for yourself, Bridget, I mean, what, what kind of services now are yourself and your family using here in the post office? Oh, all services. I pay my ESB bill. I save a bit in it for my grandchildren. And I send parcels to Australia to my son and his wife and children. And sure, it's handy at Christmas time with all the Christmas cards and posting. And what about the service? I mean, what's oh, the service is very good, very, very good. And Bernie there is a beautiful woman, lovely, very, very helpful in every way. My name is Bernadette Kelly and I do the post office here in Campile in Euros, County Wexford. Uh, I've been here a number of years and I just find the job very rewarding and I find it very exciting and I love meeting people here. How long have you been now the postmaster here in Camp Isle yourself? Uh, just uh, as postmaster, I've only been here five years. Um, but before that, prior to that, I, I worked in quite a number of post offices around the area. I was considered the supernumerary. And Bernadette, I mean, what do you love about the work? It's very obvious. I mean, I've been watching you in action for the last mm-hmm. while, uh, interacting with the customers in a brilliant, brilliant professional mm-hmm. manner. What do you love most about the work over your experience to date? Oh, I, I, I love meeting the people and, you know, you, you get an insight into their families. Actually, a day's work here is like a magazine. Everything changes so much every five, ten minutes. Like there's different stories, there's different topics. And I mean, you know, uh, with, with our volatile uh, country at the moment, you're never stuck for conversation. Like, And it's it's really good, really, really good. I'd say that, I'd say that. Everything, you know, is, is discussed over the counter, you know, and... 
what kind of services are you providing now? What are the vast array of services that are provided by the most office here in Campoil? We do everything. We do postage, we do passport express, we do dog licences, we do bill pays. We do investments, a wide range of investments, uh, varying from one year to ten years. And not alone that, but we do it for counselling service as well, which is not on our criteria, but we do it. In a way, kind of, you know, the people are telling you their problems. And as one guy says, she's she's my confessor nearly. (laughs) Absolutely. That's why we're all here for like a... Bernadette, you've been many years now at this job and you love it inside out. It's very obvious. But what got you into it in the first place? Why did you end up behind a postal counter doing what you're doing? Like a lot of things in my life, Paul, I fell into it. <laughs> and that's basically, there was someone had an accident and uh, they were looking for someone to sit in behind the counter and just kind of keep the show on the road while she was recuperating. And that's how I started. And well, how many what? years ago was that? Oh, that's over 25 years ago <laughs> over a quarter of a century ago and here you still are still loving it and living the dream of sorts well obviously got the bug and just enjoyed it like you know and, and just said here we go I do enjoy this work and that was it and what is the bug I mean describe this t- bug to the listeners now I suppose in any walk of life where you're dealing with the public there has to be uh, something like that that will attract you and keep you there like you know and um like meeting the people and hearing their stories and being there for them, like, you know, it's it's just, it's a great occupation, like, because <laughs> every hour is different and you don't get bored. And well, that's one sure thing. Yeah. Absolutely. There's no, there's never a dull moment without a doubt. You know, And you're dealing with the world and her mum and more besides. That's, that's where you know all the generations, like, you know, we, we know the babies, the grandchildren, and we hear all the stories and... You know, we're living our lives through them here with our savings books and our Cyril the Squirrels and the schools and all the rest of it. Like, it's, it's fantastic. And after my chat with Postmaster Bernadette Kelly in Campile Post Office in County Wexford, I next visited Dundrum Post Office in suburban Dublin. I'm Maureen Masterson. I work in Dundrum Post Office. You're actually the postmaster here in Dundrum Post Office. I am, yeah. Now, Maureen, how long have you been working in the postal business? 15 years. And what are the challenges of the work? Well, it's tough work, but I really enjoy my job. I love working with people. And also, it's just the changes since I took over postmaster. I originally started in Dromartin in Goatstown. And it's just every year or every couple of months, there's always new changes, you know. New products coming new products, online because obviously banking. the whole postal is, oh, yeah, is all changing. Yeah, the world yeah, is changing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Banking, phones, all the currency cards, you know, it's brilliant. And as Maureen Masterson just touched on, today's post office is successfully adapting to our modern Ireland by offering a vast array of new products and services. To explain some of them, here's Anna McHugh, Head of Communications with Unpost. Obviously there's products such as foreign exchange, cash and cards that have been hugely successful. And, you know, we have more than 35% of that business now and it's growing all the time. And we're actually bringing a multi-currency card to the market very shortly for people who travel a lot or indeed who want to use it for online shopping across a number of different markets. Um, We're very, very excited about that. And we have a fantastic current account as well. The Unpost Smart Current account that we launched last year and is absolutely flying. Again, it was designed by the customer. We spoke to the customer, saw exactly what they wanted, what was important to them. They wanted transparency and they want some features. They want to be able to put money at a little bit of a remove, some, you know, a saving mechanism or a wallet within it, which is what we gave them, but that they could get at it if they really need it, but that it makes it easier to save. And most of all, some incentives as well. So they get cash back, actual cash, not dockets or money off vouchers or things that will go out of date or that you lose in the bottom of your bag, but actual money back into their account based on the level of spend with a number of partners such as Lidl and Elvery's and SEA, Airtricity and Oxendales and others. And of course, Post Insurance, our own insurance subsidiary company. So 
I suppose it's an example of a very customer led product and one that is absolutely going from strength to strength. And what's great about it is it's transparent. You can see where the fees are. There's a five euro fee per month. But if you're spending some money with some of our partners that I listed there, you'll make that money back in no time. And you know exactly where you stand at all times. You have a lovely card. Use it in the ATM. Use it in post offices. Use it online. Um, you know exactly where you stand and it's designed to be very straightforward and transparent and that's where it, its success lies. Um, we are obviously synonymous with state savings, certs and bonds and other state savings products of which there's you know more than 20 billion on deposit that has flowed in through post offices and through the Unpost brand into state savings and they remain as popular as ever. And then moving on from there, obviously passport services, social welfare services and countless other services just too numerous to mention in this programme. The post office has been at the heart of Irish life for over 300 years. As it continues to adapt to an ever-changing Ireland, it can draw strength from its past distinguished service to the Irish people. Perhaps more than anything else, The post office possesses a traditional intimacy with the people and circumstances of Ireland that can be claimed by no other organisation. Post office customer, Ger Toner. We had a local postmaster called Dave up in Parnell Street and he was there for 37 years. And I have to tell you, Dave... Oh, Dave was just brilliant. His staff were brilliant, but Dave alone was brilliant. And you didn't have to go in to buy something in Dave's. You could go in and say, did you see such and such? Or did you hear how, you know, are you home in hospital? Oh, yeah, I seen Mick yesterday or I seen Mary or, you know, or I seen the daughter in the other day collecting the pension. And yet they're grand or, you know. And the other thing about the post office is they deliver on time. You know, you can guarantee what's going to be done. Your parcel, they'll take it in, they'll weigh it, they'll tell you to go into this side of the post office or put it on that machine and they'll tell you exactly what it costs. And my postmaster and postmistress will always say to you, well, look, if, if, you know, if that goes over a certain weight, it's going to cost you, so be careful what you have in your box. Make sure you have it properly labelled, make sure you have it taped properly. And if you even don't have it done properly, they'll take it in and do it for you. What other service would do that for you? Absolutely brilliant. I think the post office is the way to go. Every post office has always meant a lot to me. I don't know what I would do now, honestly, only for the post office. The post office, it's personal, you can come down and you know who you're dealing with. All the new services they're bringing in, some of them are absolutely brilliant. The post office is a brilliant service, absolutely. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.